Hi everyone, I hope you're all doing well and enjoying your winter breaks. I'm just going to give a little introduction about myself since I haven't formally really done that yet. So my name is Chaitanya Kumar and I'm a second year astronomy and physics student at the University of Toronto. Um, some things that I do on campus you might have seen me do are I tutor first year physics courses like Foundations of Physics and Intro to Physics. And I've also written some research papers, which you can find in, with the link in the description below. So that's just a little bit about me. And I hope you all have a wonderful Christmas and a happy new year. And I hope you enjoy the video. So the initial understanding behind how a quantum computer may be even used to model something like a wormhole uh, comes from this understanding of the relationship between the ER and EPR paradoxes. So what do these two concepts actually mean? Well, we know that ER stands for einstein rosenfridges which are basically just what we know of as wormholes. And EPR stands for the Einstein-Polsky-Rosen paradox, which has to do with something surrounding the idea of entangled particles in quantum mechanics. This uh, EPR paradox specifically states that when you have something like two entangled particles and you separate them very, very far away, if you measure the state of one of the particles, then you automatically get some information about the other particle. Let's explore this in further detail. So to take a deeper analysis into what the EPR paradox actually means, we have to first look at one of the most fundamental properties of quantum systems, uh, which is something called spin. So what spin actually stands for is a concept called intrinsic angular momentum. Now I'm sure all of you have heard of what momentum is in real life as like when you spin your arms around in a circle, um, you can feel that you have some momentum uh, carrying you forward in your uh, journey. And so intrinsic angular momentum is a property that all of these quantum particles possess which has to do with the way that um, their internal structure changes through time. And so when we have something like a, this is what's called a stern gerlach apparatus, it allows us to measure the spins of particles. So for example, you can see in the diagram here, if we have a particle going through this stern gerlach apparatus, if it has a spin of up, it can go up towards detector A, and if if it has a spin of down, we say, it can go down towards detector B. And where up, down represent the two um, separate states of angular momentum this particle may have. So for example, all its momentum may be pointed upwards, so then it may be deflected towards A, or it may all be pointed downwards towards B. This uh, further connects into the idea of entanglement, which we can see in the uh, next section of the video. Since we've explored what it means for a particle to have spin, uh, we can now explore what it means for a particle to be entangled with another particle. So let's imagine first that a photon is traveling through space, as we see here on the bottom, and then it suddenly decides to split into two uh, particles, which we know that a photon can do because of the energy and mass equivalence, um, because we know that mass and energy are one of the same. And so if that photon decides to split into two particles at the exact same moment, we know that by conservation of momentum, the particle traveling to the right has to have the same magnitude of momentum as the particle traveling to the left. So if you add the momentum of both the particles together, it should give you zero. This also applies to the idea of spin or intrinsic angular momentum for both of these particles in this case. And so what that should mean is that if we detect the spin of particle A, then it should also tell us about the spin of particle B. What's interesting, however, is that this, the idea whether A or B will have spin up or down is only decided at the moment of observation. So what this means is that when you observe, let's say you observe particle A through a stern gerlach apparatus, and you find that it has a spin pointing up, that was only decided at the moment of observation. What this means is that these particles could be thousands or even millions of light years away, and you could measure one of them, and that would automatically give the other particle information about its state. So if particle A was measured to be spin up, and it was thousands of light years away from particle B, 
Particle B would instantaneously know that it has to have a spin pointing down. So this is one of the mysteries of quantum mechanics that people are still trying to figure out today. But this property is exactly what was used to model the hypothetical wormhole in the quantum computer. So adding on to the idea of uh, entanglement is also this idea of the holographic principle, which is this theory by uh, Professor Leonard Susskind, which is that maybe our whole three-dimensional universe is actually just modeled by information on a 2D sheet. So in essence, it's called the holographic principle because you can think of it um, like a hologram that's being projected onto a 3D space by a flat 2D screen. This idea of the holographic principle also applies to black holes. So when something goes into a black hole, uh, someone might ask, it, well, where does all the information of that object go? How do you know that object was red or shiny or round? Well, we know that the information of that is actually stored on the surface of the black hole, which was proved by Stephen Hawking recently. And this idea was applied to the whole universe. And they said, well, maybe we could also model the whole universe as a hologram. So this, combined with the ideas of entanglement, is what really made the basis and what made it possible to model this wormhole inside the quantum computer. Now that we finally have all the basic ideas regarding the physics behind and the planning behind this uh, model, we can actually look at what happened during the experiment. So these beautiful uh, images by Quantum Magazine really uh, show in depth the process which they use to model this kind of uh, wormhole equivalence. So first what they did is they started off with two sets of entangled particles called uh, SYK models, which basically means you can have entanglement between many, many particles, not just one or two. And what they did is they changed a single particle in the model. So we see here, they call it a qubit in quantum computing language, and they changed a single qubit. And what one of the things we know, one of the most fundamental principles of quantum mechanics is that information spreads out in an entangled state over time. So once they switched this qubit out, the, that information of that one single qubit ch changed and spread throughout the entire system. So now we had two separate systems separated by some distance, one where the qubit was changed out and one where the qubit wasn't changed out. So then we get to step three, which is using a magnetic pulse to rotate the qubit state. So what this basically means is that they switched the angular momentum of both of the states, like basically switching the spins using a magnet. And this was kind of, uh, they hoped, what they hoped to do is model the transfer of information through a wormhole in a higher dimensional plane. So this is what it basically means. You can't see the actual information moving through, but what's happening is that the um, magnet is uh, transferring the information in a higher dimensional plane. Finally, they used another fundamental idea of quantum mechanics, which is that when you measure something, it isolates it to a single particle. So once they measured the state of the system on the right, which was the switched system, they were finally able to isolate the information, the original information that they had put in, that they switched out that single qubit and isolate it to a single particle on the right side. So basically this whole process just showed how maybe wormholes are this kind of higher dimensional object that are able to bend space time and transport um, information in a way that we can't physically see, but it's happening on a higher dimensional plane. So what implications could this discovery have for the future of physics? Well, one thing we know is that black holes are really good at generating energy around their accretion disks, which is something that I've talked about in my past research as well. However, one of the struggles and uh, hardships of this method is that there's no real way to take the energy out of the attrition disk without risk of being sucked up by the black hole itself. But now that we know that a wormhole can be modeled by a set of entangled black holes, this may prove the existence of something called white holes, which is something that instead of sucking in all the matter and energy, it spews out all the matter and energy on another side. So this may actually allow us to um, take the energy that was generated by the black hole's accretion forces and use it for uh, humanity's progress. 
Not only that, but now that we know that wormholes can be modeled by something uh, on Earth like a quantum computer, it may allow us to create many singularities in the future and even uh, generate energies on smaller scales to allow for daily human needs. Finally, one of the most important aspects of this whole experiment is a further development into the ideas of quantum gravity and a path towards a grand unified theory, because we, ne we still don't know how black holes and general rel relativity can fit into the standard model to give us this whole uh, unified formula that describes everything in the universe. Thank you uh, everyone for watching and I hope to see you guys in the next video.